Welcome to Wednesday in the Word. Yes, it's time for us to fellowship in the Word of God. And I know you have set your heart to be here on time and also have the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God, right there before you because we're going through the Scripture. We are studying the Word of God. The Bible tells us to study to show ourselves approved unto God, a workman, a workwoman that needed not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the Word of truth. We got to rightly divide this Word. And that comes to studying. That comes to being able to take the Word and go through the Bible and just see what God is saying on various subjects and matters. Well, I'm excited about this time together with you in the Word. Thank you for being part of this gathering. We are gathered together in the Spirit of the Lord. We are gathered together in the Word of God. We are united together by the Holy Spirit. So thank you for being faithful and diligent and being a part of this Wednesday in the Word uh, ministry that we have coming through Facebook and YouTube. Well, I'm going to pray and we're going to go right into the Word of God. Father, you are speaking to us through these prophetic books because you are a prophetic God. You are a God who proclaims. You are a God who promises. You are a God who can plan things beforehand. And so we are trusting you. We're trusting that path of the just that we have gotten on, Father, through faith in Jesus Christ. And you said that that path shines brighter and brighter. So thank you for revelation knowledge now as we go into the scriptures, giving us understanding in application, Father, of this wisdom of your word. We ask it all in the wonderful name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Well, Zechariah chapter 6, that's where we're going to start out today on our journey. Uh, we have been uh, ministering on these various visions that God, by the Spirit of God, is giving the prophet Zechariah concerning his covenant people, Israel and Judah, and, and also speaking in uh, the prophetic sense of looking forward to the millennial age, uh, the time of the Messiah. And so there's so much revelation that God is speaking through these prophets. And we thank God that he's given us uh, the rich word of God. And so in Zechariah chapter 6, we're going to begin today uh, with this eighth and final vision. And this eighth and final vision allows us to see what God is speaking relative to these uh, chariots and colorful horses. And, and, and thank God that uh, Zechariah has what I call a divine tour guide. Uh, he sees these things. But he's not trying to interpret them in his own intellect and out of his emotions. He asked that divine God, that angelic being, uh, what does this mean? And then the angel, the representative of God, began to explain to him what these various symbols mean. So in Zechariah chapter 1, uh, I mean chapter 6, verse 1 through 8, uh, it reads like this. Then I turned and raised my eyes, this is the prophet Zechariah, and looked and behold, four chariots were coming from between two mountains, and the mountain were mountains of bronze. With the first chariot were red horses, with the second chariot black horses, with the third chariot white horses, and with the fourth chariot dappled horses or spotted horses, strong steeds. Then I answered and said to the angel who talked with me, what are these, my Lord? You see how he's getting understanding? He's asking that divine tour guide, what does these things mean? And then in verse five, the angel has and said to me, these are four spirits of heaven who go out from their station before the Lord of all the earth. So we know that these, these, these spirits are coming out of the throne room of God. The one with the black horse is going to the north country. The white are, are going after them in the dappled or spotted are going toward the south country. Then the strong stage went out eager to go that they might walk to and fro throughout the earth. And he said, go walk to and fro throughout the earth. So they walked to and fro throughout the earth. And he called to me and spoke to me saying, see, those who go toward the north country have given rest to my spirit in the north country. I call this part of this prophecy heavenly support for divine fulfillment. Here the prophet Zechariah's attention is captivated by the vision of these chariots and these colorful horses, and as well as these two bronze mountains. These are vehicles of judgment against the nations. For four is the number of universality in biblical prophecy, and here the four chariots represents God's intervention on the world scene. 
Some, they see the coloring of the horses as having divine significance. In Revelation chapter 6, you'll see that these various horses have different colors and they are given different roles. And so the red horse are often viewed as representing bloodshed in war. We see that in Revelation 6 and 4. The black horses of the second chariot symbolizes famine and death. We see that in Revelation 6, 5 and 6. The white horses of the third chariot point to victory and triumph. Revelation 6 and 2. And the spotted strong horses of the fourth chariot symbolizes plagues. We see that in Revelation 6 and 8. And if this is the case that these horses have uh, divine significance when we look from over in Revelation, and then the assumption could be that these coloring horse, these colored horses, these various horses, they represent the various types of disaster with which God will destroy the nations which oppose his people and oppose his plan in the earth. When nations rise up against a plan of God, when people rise up against a plan or move of God, they don't realize is the depth of what they're doing. They're often very much blinded to the demonic influence that they are under and the demonic forces that's motivating them. But you can never overthrow a move of God. You can never, never overthrow a work of God. I've seen people, they try to do things in the name of, uh, of, 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 of Christ. I mean, like Paul, when he was warring against the church, he thought he was doing the will of God. He was that blinded. But thank God that God had a purpose for his life and God intervened and he was humble enough to realize, uh, who are you, Lord? And then the next question, what would you have me to do, Lord? In other words, Paul was willing to take that same motivation and zeal instead of using it by the influence of Satan and darkness and religion. He was willing to use it prophetically to proclaim the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ but to the Jews and also to the Gentiles. So we have to be careful because this is God carrying out his plan and protecting his covenant people. When he asks his divine angelic tour guide for understanding, we see that in verse five, he said, uh, the tour guide said, the angel answered and said to him, uh, these are four spirits of heaven who go out from their station before the Lord of all the earth. These angelic spirits were commissioned to execute judgment as they were sent in various directions. And I think that we as Christians, we have to realize that when we are in Christ, when God, when we're in covenant with God, we always have more with us than that are against us. And we as believers have to realize this is a spiritual kingdom we're in. This is not a kingdom where we can honor and serve and worship God through our intellect, where we can worship and honor and serve God through our human reasoning and all of that. We have to be led by the Spirit of God. First of all, we got to be born by the Spirit. We got to be born again. We got to have the life of Christ in us. We got to have the Spirit of God on the inside of us. And we got to begin to pray and pursue the things of God. And in the midst of that, God will reveal to us how great he is, how glorious he is, how mighty he is. Not how great and glorious we are, but how great and glorious he is. And so we need to have a mindset that God is working behind the scenes. If we're praying, if we're persevering in prayer, we got to realize the answer may not come right then. The answer may not come in a week or however time we want to place it in. But we got to realize that God has given us heavenly support. I believe a good example for this is for uh, uh, Daniel in the book of Daniel. Matter of fact, we'll turn there in Daniel chapter 10. Go ahead and turn there. The Bible gives us insight into a moment in Daniel's life when Daniel was seeking the Lord. 
Yes, he was praying and fasting and uh, he, I mean, he was seeking God. He had gotten revelation from the word, the prophet Jeremiah, that there was a set time that God had already uh, pre uh, uh, prophesied that certain things were going to happen relative to his covenant people. So he's just tapping into the word of God and believing God that that word that he's spoken is faithful and tr God's faithful and true to that word, but he's doing his part. He's seeking the Lord. He's putting spiritual disciplines in place. Listen, Daniel's not doing this the first of the year. It seems like he's being deep or spiritual. He's doing it purposefully. There is something he's believing God and seeking God concerning God's people. Not nothing directly for himself, but he's looking at the bigger picture. He's looking at the church. And I think that's how people got to begin to think. People are so carnal and fleshly now in the church. They always think about themselves instead of looking at the bigger picture. God has a kingdom. God has a family. God has a body of Christ. He's doing something that's edifying the church, that's building up the church. He's working through his church. And Jesus Christ is the head of that church. So in Daniel chapter 10, I'll begin at verse 2 and 3. It says, in those days, I, Daniel, was mourning three full weeks. I ate no pleasant food. No meat or wine came into my mouth nor did I anoint myself at all till three whole weeks were fulfilled. What Daniel doing? He's seeking God with all of his heart, all of his soul. He's, he's desiring to see God's will done in the life of this covenant people. He's not just trying to get something for himself. He's tapping into the will of God. And then it goes down to verse 10. The Bible says, Daniel, suddenly a hand touched me, which made me tremble on my knees and on the palms of my hand. That's the touch of God. Hallelujah. Why? He's seeking him. He's seeking the things of God. He's laying aside the desires of his flesh to pursue the things of the spirit. And he said to me, O oh, Daniel, man greatly beloved, understand the words that I speak to you and stand upright. For I have now been sent to you while he was speaking this word to me. I stood trembling. Boy, I like the way that angel approached Daniel, a man greatly beloved. God loves us. Boy, when God speaks to people, man, God says stuff about, I love you. You, you, you are my child. And sometimes we are seeking God and we just want to an answer and God wants fellowship. God wants us to enjoy the communion that we have at that moment with him. And so he comes with those words of encouragement, how much he loves us and how much we are valued by him and how precious we are to him. And when you start repeating those things, you're picking up in your heart while you're praying, man, you'll, you'll get a revelation of the love of God. And then it goes on in verse 12. Then he said to me, do not fear. That's the first thing God got to tell us. Get fear out of the way. Don't let fear dominate the system. Don't let fear resonate and stay in your heart and in your mind. Cast that fear out. So he said, do not fear, Daniel, from, from the first day that you set your heart to understand and to humble yourself before your God, your words were heard, and I have come because of your words. So this fasting that Daniel was doing wasn't a yearly thing, first of the year. This angel said, man, when you set your heart to seek God and you humbled yourself before the Lord, boy, God began to release the answer out of his throne room. But the prince of the kingdom of Persia withstood me 21 days. Now notice, this is where it gets behind the scene. Nothing in the natural. This is in the supernatural. This is in the heavenly realms. All right. And then he said, behold, Michael, one of the chief princes came to help me, for I had been left alone there with the kings of Persia. He's dealing with these demonic spirits, these fallen angels that's, that's ruling over, uh, the, uh, 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 over the kings of Persia. Yes, when you got rulers ruling with such evil, we see that going on in our present world today. All of this destruction and evil. That's a demonic spirit working through that man. That's a demonic force influencing that kind of evil and, and destru the destruction of life. Killings of people, innocent people. That's not even humane. That even, that, that's not nothing natural. That's something demonic. Satan is a murderer, is a destroyer, one who finds joy in destroying lives. And it goes on to say, uh, verse 14, Now I have come to make you understand what will happen to your people in the latter days, for the vision reserved to many days yet to come. Notice, what will happen to your people? Daniel is not selfish. Daniel is not just thinking about him and his household. Daniel is thinking about the Old Testament people of God, the covenant people, the children of Israel. God's people, and that's the attitude we got to have. 
We got to willing to pray and fast even for God's vision in our local church, for God's vision in our house. Boy, if you're praying and interceding with a sincere heart for your church, you'll never get caught up in murmuring and complaining and gossip and bickering and, and talking negative. Why? Your spirit is full of prayer and faith and love because that's what you're doing for your local church. But if you're not doing that, you don't value your local church. Because why? We pray, we call on the Lord for people that we value, things that we value that's in our heart. And the will of God should be in our heart, and the work of God should be in our heart. And then when the angel goes on, when he has spoken such words to me, he said, I turned my face toward the ground and became speechless. And suddenly one having the likeness of the sons of men touched my lips. Then I opened my mouth and spoke, saying to him who stood before me, my Lord, because of the vision, my sorrows have overwhelmed me and I have retained no strength. For how can this servant of my Lord talk with you, my Lord? As for me, no strength remains in me now, nor is any breath left in me. Daniel is just giving reverence to the prayer presence of God, to the holiness of God, but yet God it, it will not reveal himself to you, Daniel if he's playing on destroying it. He's revealing him because he's showing him how much I love you and how much I've heard your prayers, your cry, and your supplications, and I'm sending the answer to you, Daniel. Hallelujah. Verse 18 says, then again, the one having the likeness of a man touched me and strengthened me. And he said, oh man, greatly beloved, fear not. Here again, reminding him of how much God loves him. Despite what you're going through, God loves you. And you need to know that. You need to be settled in your heart that I know the Lord loved me and that you love the Lord. The Bible said, God knows those who belong to him. Yes, when you belong to God, God knows that. And he tells him, peace be to you. Be strong. Yes, be strong. So when he spoke to me, I was strengthened and said, let my Lord speak for you have strengthened me. Oh, glory to God. God wants you strong. God wants you strengthened. He's speaking peace into your life. So whatever is troubling you now, whatever may be browsing anxiety, begin to go to prayer right now in the name of Jesus and cast that thing on the Lord and begin to thank God for his peace and thank God that you're strong in the Lord and in the power of his might and begin to confess that I've got on the whole arm of God and I stand against the wiles of the enemy and after doing all, I stand. Hallelujah. That's the attitude of faith that we see Daniel have right here. And then he said, do you not know why I have come to you? And now I must return to fight with the prince of Persia. And when I have gone forth, indeed, the prince of Greece will come. But I will tell you what is noted in the scriptures of truth. No one upholds me against these except Michael, your prince. In other words, God's got some guardian angels there. God's got some angels assigned to Israel. God's got angels assigned to the church. Hallelujah. And these are warfaring angels. And so we have to be reminded that there is activity behind the scene and all God wants us to do is to persevere in prayer. Well, that's one example in the Old Testament. I got a New Testament example. Turn over to the book of Acts chapter 12. Here's a New Testament example. And all I'm doing is want to establish in us, we need to expect and know that when we are praying and persevering, that God is working behind the scene. There's some things. That's where we stay encouraged. We keep confessing the answer based on the word of God. We keep rejoicing and we keep doing the will of God. Look in Acts chapter 12 when this demonic force came through this leader to try to stop the church, stop the people of God. See, now about the time Herod the king stretched out his hand to harass from the church, uh, then he killed James, the brother of John, with the sword. And because he saw that it pleased the Jews, he proceeded further to seize Peter also. Now it was during the days of unleavened bread. So when he had arrested him, he put him in prison and delivered him to four squads of soldiers to keep him intended to bring him before the people at the Passover. See, you know what his plan is to, de to, to destroy God's leaders. You say, well, wait a minute, he killed James. You know what? God allowed that. Why? Because he had something better in store for James. James evidently had fulfilled his purpose. And get this, he was willing to die for his faith. That's the great testimony, the great witness. He would not compromise. He would not back down. He took a stand. Glory to God. And here Peter, I mean, he, he just began to just wait on the Lord. Here. That's all he can do. He's locked in prison. But thank God for a praying church. Thank God for a church that got a prayer ministry. Hallelujah. Thank God for a church that got people who come out to pray. So verse 5 says, Peter was therefore kept in prison, but constant prayer was offered to God for him by the church. I know Peter glad he got the right crowd around him. I know he's glad he in the right church. He in a spiritual church. He in a church where people pray. 
when things happen, people get together and say, let's pray, let's cry out to God, let's intercede, because they know there's an unseen realm and they know that God has power that comes out of the throne room of heaven. Hallelujah. They know that God has an anointing that one word from God can change anything in the earth. And the Bible said when Herod was about to bring him out, that night Peter was sleeping, bound with two chains between two soldiers, and the guards before the door were keeping the prison. Isn't God a God that comes right on time? Hallelujah. Now behold, an angel of the Lord stood by him, and the light shone in the prison and struck Peter on the side and raised him up, saying, Arise quickly, and his chains fell off his hands. Then the angel said to him, gird up yourself and tie on your sandals. And so he did. And he said to him, put on your garment and follow me. So he went out and followed him and did not know that what was done by the angel was real, but thought he was seeing a vision. And when they were past the first and the second guard post, they came to the iron gate that leads to the city, which opened to them of its own accord. Glory to God. That wasn't an automatic gate. They didn't have the technology that we have today that you can pull up and all of a sudden you get beamed by a certain signal and all of a sudden the gate. That was supernaturally. That gate opened up. Why? Because God knew he was bringing his servant out of bondage. And then it goes on, they went out and went down one street and immediately the angel departed from him. And when Peter had come to himself, he said, now I know for a certain that the Lord has sent his angel and has delivered me from the hand of hell and from all the expectation of the Jewish people. So when he had considered this, he came to the house of Mary, the mother of John, whose surname was Mark, where many were gathered praying. They were still praying in the midst while they were praying, spiritual Angelic beings were being released out, supernaturally setting Peter free. I want us to begin to expect and realize when we are persevering in prayer, there is something taking place in the unseen realm. Something, that's why you don't look at what you see. That's why you don't look at what you hear, I mean, listen to what you hear in the natural realm. You know God is working through that supernatural realm. You know that there could be a demonic forces trying to war against your life, war against the will of God, the word of God, but they cannot win, but we must be expecting it. We must be knowing in our heart, we must know in our heart that God is working. Why is working? Because I'm praying. The moment those people set their heart to pray, spirit of God began to work. And supernaturally, an angel set Peter free. Well, in Luke 18 and 1, listen to what Jesus said. Jesus spoke a parable unto them to this end, that men ought to always pray and not to give up, not to faint, not to allow fear and doubt and unbelief to come in their hearts and rule in their minds, but cast down all of those negative thoughts and believe God that the things which I'm praying, the things which I'm believing and confessing, I, I'm expecting it, God, and I'm expecting that you are doing something behind the scene which my natural eyes cannot see, but with my eyes of faith, I know you're working in my favor. And then when he spoke that parable about that, that unjust judge, that evil judge, that wicked judge, and that widow woman, she used her faith to get her response. She refused to quit. She refused to give up. And that old wicked judge said, I'm going to go ahead and paraphrase, give this woman what she wants, at least she wear me out. Hallelujah. Well, listen to what Jesus said in Luke 18, 6 and 8 after the parable. And the Lord said, hear what the unrighteous judge said. This judge don't represent God. This judge don't represent our Jesus. Why? Our Jesus is righteous. This judge represents evil and wickedness that get in the heart of people. He's an unrighteous judge. And will not God give justice to his elect who cry to him day and night? Notice how they're crying. They're persevering in prayer. They don't pray one time and give up. They continue praying, thanking him for it, praising him for it, rejoicing for the answer. Man, I tell you what, you'll get to a place where glory to God, you know you got it before you even see it in your heart of faith. You will be thanking God and celebrating and praising God and, and giving God all the glory and all the honor. And then he say, will he delay long over them? I tell you, he will give justice to them speedily. Who is that? God. God will give justice to them. God will give, God will give deliverance. God will give a breakthrough to, 
to them. Those who what? Who come to him, who pray, who persevere in prayer. Nevertheless, when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on earth? This is the kind of faith God's looking for. The kind of faith that believes that he's working behind the scene, knowing that if I'm praying, I'm going to persevere in prayer because heaven is sending support. Heaven, is recent, really, heaven has released out warfaring angels who's warring against those demonic spirits and those evil spirits of darkness. Because what? I'm believing and I'm trusting in God. Well, let go, let's go back to Daniel. We, we're going to close. I told you I'm not going to rush this. Let's go back to, I mean, let's go back to Zechariah. Hallelujah. I'm so excited about these men of God and uh, this giving a great witness to the glory of God. And uh, I tell you what, God is great and greatly to be praised. And so when we go back to Zechariah chapter 6, and, uh, uh, you know, we, 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 we so often listen to what people are saying about the conditions of the world. And it's real about all the things that's happening and all those things. And then we, we can listen too much to that and think, where is God? Well, I'll tell you what God is. God is fully aware of what's going on in the earth. God is fully aware. Matter of fact, he never sleeps nor slumber. He, God knows the end from the beginning. God is in control. He is a sovereign God. And so when we see these things happening in our world today, we remember now that God's word revealed that despite what's trouble and evil that goes on in the world, God is fulfilling a purpose and plan. And that's what we find here in the book of Zechariah, that, that this prophetic revelation that Zechariah is speaking, he's speaking concerning what God is planning to do in the life of his covenant people. And we have to have that kind of God kind of faith. Jesus Christ, when he came, you know, those disciples and others, they couldn't understand uh, the path and the process God was going to use. So a lot of doubt and unbelief was there. Jesus told them how he was going to suffer and go before the council and, you know, be crucified. They, they, didn't, hear, they didn't hear that. Matter of fact, Peter rebuked him. And, and, and Jesus had to, had to tell him, get behind me, Satan. See, so often we look for God in a certain way that we think he should come. And the Bible tells us his ways are not always our ways, or his thoughts are our thoughts. But as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are his ways and our ways. I'd rather have God's ways. I'd rather have God's thought on this. And all we have to do is trust him. But those disciples, they couldn't, they couldn't really put confidence in Jesus because why? Look at the suffering. Look at the cross. He's dead. But remember, he said, I will rise again on the third day. That's the glory of God. And a lot of times we don't get to see the glory because we give up in the process. We let doubt and unbelief come in. Hallelujah. But there's some glory to come forth and we are to give God the glory uh, that's due his name. Whatever God has forecasted in his word, God is going to bring it to pass. Hallelujah. No matter what goes on in the earth, the will of God will be fulfilled in the earth. And in the meantime, we ought to remain faithful. We ought to remain faithful to the things of God. And so in Zechariah 6 and 7, and I'm closing, he tells him, he said, then the strong steeds went out. This is the group of those horses, those spotted horses, eager to go. Notice they were ready to go. They were ready to carry out that commission. And the Bible say uh, 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 they were eager to go that they may walk to and fro and over. And he said, go, walk through it. Boy, God told them, go ahead and do it. Boy, sometimes people talk about, oh, I want to do this for the Lord. And I, think, I believe God is telling them, do it. Oh, I want to go out and start witnessing for the Lord. Well, go out and do it. I want to begin to share my faith. It's not going to happen until you start doing it. You can pray all day. Lord, I'm believing you that I'm going to share my faith today. But then God gives you opportunity. Just begin to do it. Don't be ashamed of the gospel. Don't worry about rejection. That, 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 you know, that's part of the suffering. But think about the seed that could be sown in good ground and that could bring forth a harvest. And because you had the courage to open your mouth and share God's good, God, the gospel, now share the good news of Jesus or share the testimony that you have of how Christ came in your life, that could be a seed sown in somebody's heart. And that person later on could be a year or two later or whatever, Boy, they could come to salvation based on that seed that was sown and God watered that seed. 
and they can end up being a great mouthpiece for the Lord and lead thousands and thousands and thousands of people into the kingdom of God. But it goes back to you having the courage at that moment to share the good news of Jesus Christ, the salvation of the Lord. And because of your willingness to, to act on that faith, to share your faith, look at how much impact is having even though you could be out of the earth and lives are still being transformed because you were willing to share the good news of Jesus. So these, these, these chariots, these horses, they're ready to go to carry out the commission. And the Bible said they walked through and forth the earth. And verse 8 said, he called to me and spoke to me saying, those who go through the north country have given rest to my spirit in the north country. So when God comes out and he talks about giving rest to his spirit, one translation say, they quiet my spirit. It means to cause God's anger or wrath to be satisfied. That is, God proclaims victory over the powerful enemies of the north. That's what the north symbolizes. Those were the, one of their worst enemies were in the north. And so God sends what? He sends these black horses to the north, these strong horses, and they defeat them. Hallelujah. That's right. They defeat them and God's wrath, God's justice, God's judgment is satisfied. Hallelujah. I tell you what, anything God's in is going to be a winning uh, 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 end result. Yes. Anything God is in, the end result is going to be victory. Hallelujah. Because our God is a God of victory. Well, in closing, I have a faith action question, just one question, and the question goes like this. How are you persevering in prayer? How, how are your persevering prayers being shaped and strengthened by knowing God is working behind the scenes of life events? How's that shaping your persevering prayers? The prayers you got to wait on God. The prayers that involve somebody else's heart being changed. That's persevering prayers. Knowing that God has answered my prayer, knowing that God hears my cry, knowing that if I ask anything according to his will, he hear me, and I have the petition that I've asked of him, having that kind of confidence should cause your faith and my faith to be so strong because we know God is working behind the scene. When we're sleeping, he's working. When we're not even thinking about the matter, he's working. And so it strengthens, it should strengthen our faith. Well, the only announcements I have is uh, this coming Sunday, Word Alive, you know what that means. First Sunday, Celebration Sunday for us as financial disciples and carrying out the will of God and the work of God. Thank God that we realize that in this earth, our time here is temporal. We are truly pilgrims traveling through. Our citizenship is in heaven. So we lived a life of balance. We know what is belong to God. Hallelujah. That's what Jesus told them when they asked him in the, you know, about paying taxes. He said, give to Caesar what is Caesar, but you give to God what is God. In other words, if you're going to honor man's system, make sure you honor God's system first and foremost. And so that's our Sunday that we honor the Lord with our financial disciple. Beyond tithes and offering, we give a, a sacrificial seed we call financial discipleship seed. In our two-in-one marriage ministry, they're going to be connecting on May the 14th at 11 a.m. You can just reach out to anyone on the team uh, and, and find out what that looks like. But we want to encourage couples to get together. If you can't make this activity or this activity that they're doing, it's not something that resonates with you or you can't uh, make it due to your schedule. There'll be other things, but find some things where you can join in. It's good when God's people get together. It is as iron sharpening iron. We strengthen one another. Well, God bless you and thank you for joining me for Wednesday in the Word.